culture. Glad to be back at it again. It seems like a long, long, long time since we, we've been here. <laughs> way, any of you living together, if you want to scoot your chairs close together, you're welcome to. So, <laughs> so uh, well, we're so glad the library is, is, is allowing this. And, and uh, well, I uh, have some uh, on my clipboard to pass around. Some of you have been here before, are very familiar with that. Uh, uh, for, for one thing, I have a clipping on the front. A uh, picture of Rick and Pam Tandon, and and uh, Rick was killed in an auto accident just this last November, and he he was very regularly here attending here, and he did the program. Uh, as, as Jack and Elizabeth Henson, who some of you may remember his program by any chance now, and, and uh, you know, they were a couple from Tennessee uh, whose sons were killed. Well, I won't go into all the detail now, but it, uh, it was quite a it was quite a story there. Uh, and the uh, poor fan has been just been so lost without him. She she had to have some major surgery on her neck, especially. So, so I, I did put the her picture on there that somebody might remember. And then uh, we do have General Worcester statue, General Worcester statue out here in the front. Uh, and we had the dedication here not too long ago. And, and uh, we. We did break tradition. We actually allowed a Revolutionary War speaker here in our Civil War roundtable, <laughs> uh, and uh, that's a, uh, such a special statue. And another gentleman that passed away he was regularly here with Ed Pierce, the <laughs> Brigadier General Robert Lee, and uh, he, he was here for programs, especially for our May uh, our May Civil War days. So. Well, uh, well, where is our roundtable? It's concerned, I just the same as free and open to the public. And uh, hopefully, we are continuing. We, we do our best anyhow to continue with quality programs. And I know this is a top quality program here this evening. And, and uh, we do have, well, we, thank you to our Civil War roundtables. Uh, we do not have dues and such. In fact, the library uh, does not allow us to charge anything. But if anybody wants to make a donation, we're allowed to collect the donations. You know, uh, we suggest maybe ten dollars a year or whatever. And our Char Charlie, our treasurer here, uh, well, if anybody has some loose change in your pockets, you might like to like to get rid of. I think Charlie would be glad to take care of that. So I appreciate Charlie uh, helping out with that. And, and uh, well, of course, we've had co-sponsor these programs with our with our uh, uh, with the library here. We have Diana here in the back. Is in Head of the uh, uh, of the adult program here. I don't know. I had anything you'd like to say? Well, oh. um, just that we're happy you guys are coming back. We're happy to have programs again, and we're excited to be here with you. Yeah, the, well, yeah, they, folks here at the library just bend over backwards to cooperate uh, with us for the for the several years now. And uh, well, we do have our W guest number and some surveyors that have donated uh, some very nice funds. And uh, Ed and Penny Gasborn, uh, and uh, just before we had to close up with the pandemic, was when they sponsored a dinner with Abraham Lincoln. And we, we gained quite a bit of money from doing that, so which is very special and kind of ironic since. Since we had to close up, we, we have this money now that we don't know what to do with. So <laughs> I think we'll find places. And, uh, and John, John Spaziano, by normal, normally our gratuity for our speakers is $100 to at least cover expenses anyhow. And, and John refuses any of that. And he, has, he has donated extra funds. And John's here, been here for a lot of our programs. And, and uh, well, you, you might recall uh, John now. Uh, uh, well, he has done a program for Confederate General Samuel Cooper, higher for us, and who was the highest ranking Confederate officer. And he was here with the uh, first Confederate submarine, the Huntley. Uh, speaking as First Lieutenant George Erasmus Dixon from the 21st Alabama. And I were we any of you on, with the submarine when turning the crank here back when John did that program? Okay, well, uh, that was a, such a special program, too. And, uh, well, John has 
doesn't offended many of our programs anymore. And we are honored to have him return to Worcester again. Our future attractions uh, are our normal program is the third Tuesday of the month. And uh, next month, uh, we look forward to Charlie's program here on Wayne County at the Battle of Pennsylvania Courthouse, as told in the year 1900 by Captain Robert Eddy. And Charlie is with the Wayne County Historical Society with their military committee, in fact, they're headed military committee. So, so uh, and I, well, I guess you're familiar now with where we have to have people send in reservations, and maybe some of you know that our average attendance before uh, before all this monkey business was about 75 people. So we usually would fill this room up. So, so I'm glad at least we can at least do, do this much anyhow. You know. And then on uh, uh, November 16th uh, uh, is when, well, Nobody objects anyhow. We thought that might be an appropriate time for old Abe Lincoln himself to tell, to tell about the battles of Gettysburg and the events leading up to his few appropriate remarks that he was asked to deliver to Gettysburg on November 19th. So, uh, and uh, well, I understand old Abe has a, has a PowerPoint uh, for that and so forth. So. And uh, well, I'll pass the clipboard around. Some of you are familiar. I have a list of everybody that's signed up. Uh, I have not really updated the list since our, our last get together. And uh, if you would, uh, they were alphabetical, at least I, that's my intention anyhow. Uh, and if there's any changes for you or anybody else that you know of, like especially if somebody has moved out of the area or something, uh, no use of setting uh, notices to, I maybe might make a mark for that as an update. And if you're not on the list, uh, there are some blanks here that back here that you uh, can fill in and I'll, I'll sure get those into the computer times. So we'll go ahead and go ahead and pass this around then. And I appreciate making sure I get the clipboard back here at the, at the end of the evening. So, so um, well, anything else, anybody? Hey, yeah, Jerry, I got this down from Mr. Peter Carey. There's a beautiful book that the Main Street Worcester is selling. Uh, Ten bucks. I hope you aren't sold out. I got a couple copies in there. The stories contest from uh, earlier in the year they ran, and I read mine. They're all excellent. And there is one there towards the end of the person who wrote about General David Worcester returned back to Worcester 200 years later, and it's quite a cute story. And uh, they're all all really good stories. And, and of course. Some of the stuff, actual crap details, and others, no, not factual. Was I can't remember the name to be called, but uh, they had the, the people who submitted the column. There was about fifty of them submitted. They picked the ten best, and they're really good stories. So if you're interested in reading uh, stuff about Worcester, uh, there's one on the stack, the uh, atlases at the courthouse, what they've seen over the years. So, but the one about robot General David Worcester, I thought he's out front here. Uh, fuel, and I'm, I'm sure the library bought a copy. I'm sure they might have mail to read here. But if you're interested in some good stories, <laughs> uh, get to the Main Street Worcester. I think they're selling it uptown that, or at the Post uh, Star and another place too. Okay, thank you very much. Anything else, anybody? Well, I'm looking forward to. Colonel William Calvin Oates. Thank you for attending the 25th anniversary of the Isaac Trimble Sons of Confederate Veterans Chapter. I'm Colonel Oates. Can you hear me back there? My dad on. Tonight, I'd uh, like to tell you a little bit about myself for those of you uh, that we haven't met. I want to review a summary of the Battle of Gettysburg with particular emphasis on day two of the 15th and 44th Alabama Fort, along with the 4th and 5th Texas. And we'll talk a little bit about, since this is 25 years after the battle, we'll talk a little bit about what uh, 
some of us Confederates have been doing after the Civil War. So why Colonel Lowe's? They come from a place you probably never heard of. It's a little town by the name of Abbey, Abbeville, Alabama. Real small town. And I'll tell you what my friends always, uh, always say about me. Uh, we say two things consistently. You know, William, I know you always wanted to go to school, but you had to, you had to help the pack on the farm. And I always tried to do that. The other thing they always said, you know, William, if you don't find trouble, trouble's always going to find you. Over the years, I've had three warrants for my arrest. And one of them was due to, uh, he had two sisters in town, the Fox sisters, and they claimed they were communicating with the dead. And you know what? Being a Christian person that I am, I just didn't believe that. So I decided to go to a seance. And at the seance, they were trying to get a seat of table to, to rise up and move and make all kinds of sounds and stuff. But all I did, just common sense, I just put my hands on the table. You know what? It didn't move. Now Daddy Fox, he got all kinds of angry because those sisters were making a lot of money for him. So he chased me down Main Street, picked up the gun and was going to shoot me. Now if somebody was going to shoot me, what would you do? Defend yourself. I picked up the shovel, hit him square in the head, he went down bleeding, and I thought I'd kill the guy. So I left town. And I had drifted around, I left Alabama, went through Florida, Louisiana, into the panhandle. Finally, somebody sent word and said, you know what, Daddy Fat Fox really did survive, so you can come on back to Alabama, which I did. And in between the farming season and the spring and such, I actually studied law, became a lawyer. But I think you know what happened next. From this little tiny town, little tiny area, of course the Gulf of Mexico is right here, Florida is over here, Texas is over here. Along come that thing that we call the Civil War. Well, I know you folks call it a number of things, but we call it the Civil War. So I decided I was going to raise a regiment right here in Hattonville, Alabama. And it was all my friends, my neighbors, cousins, fathers, sons, nephews. And they elected me because I thought I was an honest man. They said, well, this guy Oates is probably okay. We're going to elect him a captain. <coughs> and I want to tell you the end of the story and then I'll fill in all the details. Look at how bad the Civil War was. That's poor folks in Alabama. That regiment started with 1,958 men. Directly killed in action. Of course, we call it casualty. Killed, was wounded, missing, deserted. Not necessarily just killed. Anybody want to guess at the end of the war? How many of us Alabamians were actually paroled after 1958? Anybody got a guess? 125. Very close, sir. 170 of us showed up at Appomattox Courthouse. Now, people deserted, people straggled, a lot of that going on. But just a little bit, a little bit less than 10%. Now, we weren't very well equipped. You know, a lot of the boys had, they had their farm rifles. They didn't have this fancy mini ball stuff and, and rifle muskets like, like those boys in blue. You know, we were, we were 20 years behind the times. But we made do. And if you don't tell anybody, of course, we picked up a lot of equipment along the way from Jackie's Ranch. <laughs> But early 
in the Civil War, I was very, very fortunate. I got to know Colonel General Stonewall Jackson. We fought in the Valley Campaign. Many of you are familiar with the Valley Campaign. I hear tell around these parts that they tried to do some play acting here just recently about the Valley Campaign with the Battle of Cross Keys in particular and First Current Staff. But old Stonewall, I tell you, he drove us, he drove us hard. We kept, we was twice as fast as the Union Army. They just couldn't catch up with us. And you know, I hear tell from my friends on the Union side that this campaign is still studied in the U.S. Army Academy at West Point, New York. And all kidding aside, in 2021, it's still studied at West Point. So we bottled up, old general, and then the thing with banks, with less than 4,000 troops, we prevented his entire army from reinforcing down at the peninsula. So yeah, they made a defeat at Old Stonewall at Kernstown, but we did what we needed to do. We stopped them from uniting. Here I am, Colonel Oates, getting my getting my orders from Old Stonewall. Because when he gives his orders, he expects you to carry them out. Go do it, Sonny said. Go we'll get it done. General Trimble, bless his mouth and his soul. We were under his command. Before being, tra being transferred to uh, to the old war horse, General Long Street. And as you can see, the 15th Alabama, depending on how you count, the way I count it, we fought in 13 major battles. 13 major battles. If you notice all the names on the, the Union flag on the first slide, couldn't fit all the battles on it. Ran out of flares, just couldn't fit all the batteries. And I don't know the exact number anymore. I know people have been already writing about the war. But this, can you picture this being in this, this little town of Winchester? Some people say it changed hands 72 times. I heard the other night in another reunion meeting it changed hands 90 times. Somebody else said it changed hands 102 times. Yeah. All I can tell you is it changed hands a lot. Those people must have been like, their head must have been spinning. The veterans are in the union, the veterans are in. Like, who's in today? <laughs> we fought valiantly, capturing off this ferry, <laughs> taking 12,000 prisoners, allowing, allowing General Lee to unite with Stonewall Jackson, A.P. Hill. At the Battle of Antietam, so we call Chelmsford. And finally, being transferred to General Longstreet's Corps as part of uh, General Law on the Hood's Division. And that's where most of our story and most of our my command takes place. So I was in command of this unit for a little over a year. About a year and a half. They said I was liked and respected by my troops. And frankly, I didn't really care if I was liked or not. When you're in the army and you're in the thick of it, that was like this. About the only thing that counts is people obeying commands and discipline. Yeah, I got in my share of fights, and yeah, I was aggressive. And of course, my old age here, I kind of mellowed down a little bit. I'm going to fight once a month instead of once a week. <laughs> I did leave from the front. And if you want to take the opportunity to check out the uh, miniature before you leave, Colonel Oates and another fine gentleman I'm going to be talking about here in a moment, Colonel Joshua Chamberlain, 20th name. Yeah, he's 
Gettysburg. Anybody have an idea why we support Gettysburg? What's so special about Gettysburg? Sir? Anybody? It was just a coincidence that the North and the South both didn't each other there. Yeah, pretty much. Anybody else have an idea why Gettysburg? I mean, 25 square miles, like 2,000 people, 2,200 people. What's so special about Gettysburg, sir? Well, they talked about it being there because they heard it was a shoe factory, but I've heard that that wasn't correct. Well, I'm a little guy, and when I went to school in real life, the real, the real me, that's exactly what I was taught. In fact, <coughs> if, I could, if you allow me to step out of character for just a moment, there are some pretty darn famous books, like this one, that swears on a stack of Bibles that it was for over shoes. Let me get ahead of myself, get back into character, and tell you a little bit about that. First of all, there was never a shoe factory in Gettysburg during that period of Civil War. Second of all, General Ewell had passed through Gettysburg on his way to Harrisburg, because Harrisburg was the target way back when. And General Ewell winds up at the southern bank of the Susquehanna River, looking down on the Pennsylvania capital that was only guarded by militia. And when militia sees a regular army coming with cannons and a little bit of cavalry and lots of guns, a whole corps, it's like, like that baby. They would have ran like jackrabbits. Also bear in mind, General Early was coming up the eastern side, gets to the Wrightsville Bridge, and those darn Yankees, they burned it. So yes, General Harry Heath does ask permission from A.P. Hill to go reconnoiter into Gettysburg and see what supplies he could find. When the Confederates did that, they would make a series of demands, <coughs> 20,000 pounds of food, some flour, some shoes, some uniforms, and the people in the towns they knew the Union was coming, what did they do? They hid their most valuable stuff, including the, life, the life, livestock. So they, they'd give the Confederates a little money, hope they'd go away and not destroy the town, and that would be that. So you're absolutely right, except for shoes. And you're right, it wasn't about shoes. Gettysburg is an interesting place. It is a major crossroad in southern Pennsylvania. And if you count them up, one, two, three, four, five, six, there's ten, if I get them all, roads that converge on Gettysburg. When General Meade heard about Gettysburg, his comment to his staff was, my God, whoever takes Gettysburg, I think his words were, it might be the war, something to that effect. He knew how important and strategic it was. The other interesting thing about the battle, it's just the opposite of what you would expect. The Confederate Army was on the march. So guess where the Confederate Army came from? They entered Gettysburg generally from the north. President Lincoln, being the smart strategist that he was, says to General Lee, your target is General Lee, but no matter what, you have to protect Washington City and Baltimore. So Meade's objective was to keep his army between the federal capital and General Lee. So he had to get his guard from the south. Here is the circuitous path of the Union Army. Here is the path AP Hill's Corps. Yule, early June, Winchester, back and forth, Winchester, Harvest Ferry, Longstreet's Corps, and there, ladies and gentlemen, is Harrisburg, when on June 29th, General Lee sends a panic dispatch to General Yule and General Early, who is over here somewhere, and says the fight's going to be in Gettysburg. That's where the Union Army's going. Anybody see an error on that slide? It has nothing to do with the armies. 
And this is from uh, what used to be the Civil War Preservation Trust, which is now the American Battlefield Trust. The District of Columbia did not exist at that time. <laughs> So people, uh, when they think about Gettysburg, people talk about the charge, they talk about the round top, but let us not forget, when General Hayden's army comes down the pipe, and General Buford, with some 2,200, 2,400 dismounted cavalry, tries to slow him down, and uh, Heath has got something like uh, 7,541 troops against, uh, let's call it 2,400, because you know the one of four cavalry men has to hang on to the horses and protect the ammunition and such. That's a major battle. That is a major battle. And as the day progresses, more Confederates come on the field, General Yule shows up, General Stout Hill shows up, and they gradually push. Union Army back through the city of Gettysburg, but fortunately for the Union Army, they wind up with either Cemetery Hill and Council. General Buford realized how good the ground was. And if I step out of character, and you remember the movie Gettysburg, he says something to uh, um, Gamble, one of his. Uh, Gate commanders, he's leaning on the fence and he points and he says, if we don't hold that high ground, they'll be held with that. And that's put in my way. So General Buford, even though know, he's got arthritis and he's kind of sickly and what have you, he finds the cupola at the Lutheran Cemetery, takes a look on the battlefield, realizes the grave situation, sends words to his course. Of the first corps, General Reynolds, to come for help. Right one. Hmm, something's missing. <laughs> so, why did it work? Well, it worked. This is an 1863 Sharps carbine. It worked because the cavalry boys were firing breech loaded weapons. Not your standard Enfield or Springfield. These can, things can be loaded rapidly. Breach, stop, fire. Good at probably 60 to 80 yards. You can picture a skirmish line out there, a couple hundred yards in front of, this, of the Lutheran Seminary, to slow down. And of course, he's got some artillery with him. Firing rapidly to slow down Heath in time for General Reynolds to come up and to support the battle. By the time it's all over, I'm guessing there's upwards of 50,000 troops on the field by the end of day one. Major battle. Major battle. One of the secrets to day one, right there. Confederates coming in from the northwest, pushing the Union back through the city. And of course, at that point, they entrench on the high ground. So here I am in my, my young and foolish days. Uh, frankly, if I step out of character for a second, I have contacted eight different historians, and I have done an extensive Internet search, library search, university search, book search. By the way, this is about a third of the number of books I have. I have this one, which we'll have there. I just got two heavy characters. And there's only two pictures of Oates that I've come across. That's one of them. You'll see several versions. Um, some of them are cropped, some of them are far away. If anybody comes across a picture of Oates, Different than what I'm showing you, please let me know. 
See, the same picture, just a little shadows, right? And Colonel Oates becomes forever entwined with the Union Colonel of the 20th Day, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. Their names uh, will forever be linked in history. So day two, a lot of things going on day two, a lot of moving parts. I'm only going to cover a very, very narrow slice of day two. It was an all-day battle. We all know the story about General Sickles and the Third Corps being where he wasn't supposed to be. So what went wrong? The General Lee doesn't have his cavalry. Jeb, Jeb Stewart is out on a joyride somewhere way out in the east because he had to get way around the Union Army. So Lee is blind. He doesn't know a lot about where's the flank in the Union Army. The flank's very important. He's trying to attack the flank. In this particular case, he becomes the left flank of the Union Army. So he sends out early in the morning, probably before sunrise, one Captain Johnson. Now history gets a little fuzzy. We don't know for sure. But Captain Johnson claimed in his report to General Lee, and he goes out with a scouting party with several, that he got as far as Little Round Top. General Sawyer, ain't no soldiers out here. Didn't see any blue guys at all. Early in the morning. So General Lee says, I'm going to form a battle plan. General Longstreet, this is your attack today. You look at Corps Fort dramatically and valiantly on day one. It's your turn, General Longstreet. On day two, I want you to attack. Up the end is the road. Because this is what I want to hit. Little Round Top, ladies and gentlemen, was not the objective. Little Round Top was kind of the accident. Because guess what? Sickles ain't supposed to be there. Yeah. And if you remember from the movie, the movie still picture thing, you all know about that, right? The General Hood and General wants me to argue. General Lee, General, we should go to the right. We can have a flank of We should move to the right. General Hood's being operated on after he got, he got wounded. Longstreet goes to see him. He says to General Longstreet, Pete, we should have moved to the right. Well, Sickles is in a way. So where is most of the fighting early in the day? Right where it's not supposed to be. Oh, and by the way, General Longstreet is taking this famous route that Captain Johnson gave because they wanted this to be a surprise attack. So here's the high ground, some six to eight hundred feet above the battlefield. Longstreet did not want to be seen. He wanted a surprise attack. Well, he looks up on what we now know as Little Round Top, which didn't even have a name back in those days, and he sees the signal corps up there. Guess what? The last people you want to see, that want to see you, are the Signal Corps. Because what are they going to do? They're going to look away. Here comes the Confederate Army. It's going to be all over the battlefield. The Union is going to know it's just like that. So what does General Longstreet do? Instead of attacking the first light, he has the counter march. And he's way over here. By the time the battle commences at that portion of the battlefield, it's somewhere between three and 3.30 in the afternoon. Now why is it I can't give you the exact time that the battle started? Everybody had watches. Why can't I give you the exact time? Standard time didn't come in until the Transcontinental Railroad. So everybody kind of synchronized their watch and kind of guessing by sunrise what time it was. Now the Union probably thought the battle started at a different time. Because they don't have standard time either. So we've got an unstandard time battle, way late in the afternoon, against a portion of the Union Army that's not even supposed to be there. Things aren't exactly going right, are they? Not yet. <coughs> now, here's the battle plan as General Lee 
described it. It looks kind of neat, doesn't it? It looks very precise. Here's Hood, Georgians and Texans, the claws, the van the wall with the Alabamians, and all we gotta do is come across this valley and attack the various lanes of the Union Army. Anybody think it went like that? Okay, what do we got? We got people on the top of the hill shooting at us. We have very, very rugged terrain. We are going uphill. And the unit had gone, oh, the other thing, by the way, during the Battle of Gettysburg, General Lee loses about a third of his officer corps, colonels, majors, non commissioned officers, like that, sergeants. Two regiments, 4th and 47th, don't even have a command at certain portion of the general that uh, Colonel Oates picks up to try to establish some order as these regiments get all entangled. And they're still trying to follow orders. So if you're looking over the shoulder of the Confederate Army, that's what it might look like. Coming up the hill, open fire to the Union regiments, 20th Maine, 88th Pennsylvania, 6th Michigan. Anybody guess why there's no cannons in the picture? No cannons in that portion of the battle? They couldn't get them up the hill. Certain portions of the hill did have cannons. If you go to the right up, you'll see it has this battery, which would have been located. This is the left of the Union flank, more toward the right of the Union flank of the plateau of the Grand Top. There were several batteries. The reason there's no particular battery up here is a cannon is a long range weapon. Fires like this, only fire like that. Wouldn't be much use at that point. It was great use. These boys were half a mile, two miles away. Look what they fight. Run into rain. Runs at a 15, 20 degree angle. A lot of debris, a lot of stones. The regiments all tangled up. And generally a mess. Like so. That's the hill, open field, coming across, being fired upon consistently and continuously. By the way, these were all very, I, I didn't jot down which was which, but these were all famous paintings and lithographs of the time. Now, the miniature is not exactly the scale, but if you can look at the size of the boulders, formed by a volcanic eruption back millions of years ago, compared to the size of a typical soldier, you can see the kind of terrain that they were trying to fight their way through. Not an easy task. It broke up the army pretty badly. So the race for the high ground, an attorney from Erie, Pennsylvania, Colonel Strong Vincent, is given the word by Governor Warren, Henry Warren, who is the chief of staff for General Meade, that the whole damn Confederate Army is coming down the road. We got to get to the high ground. The only people on the high ground are signal corps. What are we going to do? So his only authority, without the authority, without the orders from the commanding general, the only one who does not have a line command into the army. He is a staff officer. So think about this from a chain of command standpoint. The risk that he took, knowing he was doing the right thing, he had no authority over these soldiers. He had no real ability to command those troops. He grabs Colonel School and Vincent, who looks up on a hill and says, I'll take my old regiment in Pennsylvania. I'll get him up there and I'll recruit some people along the way. They could have been court martial. I don't think it ever happened, but just, just put that in perspective. Um, Harvard attorney, not a military man, because he became a fine military man, 
several minutes into, into the battle, as he's uh, urging his troops on, Vincent is shot dead. And to this day, if you go to the Round Top, there is a statue. And it can't be Colonel Vincent because colonels weren't allowed to have statues. Only generals were allowed to have statues. But there is a statue, coincidentally very close to where Colonel Vincent was shot, that looks a lot like Colonel Vincent, except he was famous for carrying a riot prop. So what did the Union boys do? They gave him a sword instead of a riot prop so people could say, that isn't strong Vincent, he never would have carried a sword. It's a beautiful statue, too, this one. Though. And of course, Joshua Chamberlain is given the order by a couple of his commander, you shall hold in this place the far left flank of the Union Army at all hazards. You shall not retreat. This is your position. And if you put it in the parlance of all hazards in 1863, you're going to live and you're going to die here. Now, let's put something else in, in perspective for the West Point people. In the manual of the day at West Point, it says very clearly, if you are to attack a fortified position against a dug-in enemy, you need, based on the Pomeranian tactic, 2.5 times the number of troops that your opponent has. Guess what? These were valuable numbers all throughout the day. A typical regiment, depending on what they're expecting in battle, they would carry 30 rounds, 40 rounds, maybe 50 rounds maximum. I do not know for sure how many rounds the 20th Maine carry. <coughs> These boys are fighting like crazy, shooting like crazy, knowing what their orders are. They run out of ammunition, and this portion of the movie is reasonably accurate. With one annoying exception. He refuses his line, forms a right angle, and by the way, we actually believe that Captain Spears is uh, his chief, uh, the side his brother, his chief number two, the brother being the lieutenant, uh, was the one that actually called the Bay of There was a conference between Spears and Joshua Chamberlain. From the, uh, from the conference comes the Bay of charge. Down the hill they go, basically out of ammunition. The Confederates are, su are surprised. Like, what the heck expects? A bunch of Union guys that come running down the hill. I mean, the bayonet was really a, you know, it was a Stonewall Jackson thing. It wasn't really a Union thing, for the most part. So charging down the hill, and many Confederates surrender. I come to Lotus, I order a retreat to save as many Alabamians as I can. Several hundred are captured, many from the 4th and 5th Texas. And as is tradition, you know, you see in movies, they're always handing over their sword. Well, in the Civil War, what we saw most of the time is that they would hand over their revolver. So since Oates orders a retreat, he gives his revolver out of respect for Joshua Chamberlain, and this is an 1863 cult, very similar to the one that Oates carried in the battle. Out of respect, he gives his revolver to one of his lieutenants to surrender to Joshua Chamberlain. Chamberlain is coming down the hill with the rest of the Union. The original pistol sits in the Bowdoin College Museum at this point in time. I'm trying desperately to get a picture of it. They sent me all kinds of information, but for some reason they do not want to release a picture of it. I don't know what. I have no idea. And I understand my good friend Ted Chamberlain, who is the distant cousin, of Joshua Chamberlain, he tells me the revolver is in really good shape. And by the way, as I step out of character for a moment, we had a great honor this July 2nd with 
Colonel Chamberlain and Captain Spears, and I, Colonel Oates, we did a reenactment on Little Round Top. And we recruited, we did that portion of the battle, we recruited an army of Confederates and Union about this high, we had about 36, 38 recruits. My regiment was mostly young girls, they were great. And we did our charge four or five times up the hill. And then eventually we surrendered. And of course, I surrendered my pistol to Colonel Chamberlain. Now, one of the keys to the battle, this is the what was believed to be the far left flank. This is the 20th Main Monument, as it stood at home. This is taken from two years ago. Um, believed to be the left flank, if you will, the right flank is way over here. As he recruits, refuses the line, he comes up to become a right angle configuration because the Alabamians, we're trying to get around him, but somewhere in there, that we probably can't see, is the regiment of the second U.S. sharpshooters driving long range and sometimes repeating rifles to hit pour and fire into the Alabamians. And I write, some 15 years after the war, that I really believed, Earl Oates really believed, that he was up against a whole division of Union that was just hiding in the woods. He had no idea that they were short shoes. That's what would give him a fair amount of trouble. All right, so the after action before, no excuse, just what happened, what could the Confederates have done differently. They did march 20 miles in the July heat. They ran the water. Colonel Oates orders one from each brigade. Here's the canteens, go get water. By the time they were out getting water, the battle started. Never made it back with water. So five charges up the hill, plus the retreat, plus in Chamberlain's words, they ran like cattle during a lightning storm, they were dehydrated. Now I wrote a few years ago that I thought. That if we had just one brigade of reinforcement to come up, to get around this hill, and then concentrate on the center of the 20th thing, that we could have taken that hill. But you know, folks, I realized over the years that that's not true. And the reason it's not true is because General Meade, the smart general that he was, put some 6,000 troops as the day went on. All along the line. So even if we rolled up the 20th Maine and the 6th Michigan and the 88th Pennsylvania, there was a whole spring of boys and blue over here that we just never would have gotten through. Maybe we would have we would have broken through temporarily at Cash Down Road. Maybe we could have reached some havoc to the supply chain of the Union Army. But as far as really doing major damage. I think it's out of that just won't be true. And I have said, and Chamberlain and I, by the way, have communicated, and I have said that it was Chamberlain. This is one of the quotes from my memoirs. It was Chamberlain that saved the little round top. In that portion of the movie where the commander of the 88 Pennsylvania comes over, shakes his hand, and says, Colonel, that was the damnedest thing. Well, I don't know what he said, but it was the damnedest thing. And he's got some. Constructed fire from the second USS structures. And moving to the last one. There is a very famous boulder. Uh, Picture I had it was too dark, it wouldn't show up. My brother was sick that day. 
I really am in fact I never should have laid him on a field. He kept saying, William, William, what would what would the army think if I didn't show up for that? Now they would think me to be a coward. All of my friends, all of our relatives, I gotta be in this battle. He wasn't up to it, and I probably contributed to his death. And then our little little reenactment, I had a Confederate soldier about that high on a boulder, and when we gave him the word, he did, but that dying and, and scene that I've seen you in the movies, you know, he was like that, and like, ah, really good. Now, if you read Joshua Chamberlain, he does not agree that old sword of the retreat. On his dying day, Colonel Holden swears on his dead Bibles that he ordered the retreat. Chamberlain doesn't agree with that. Just another one of those recollections after the war. Here's your fish hook. Of course, broken up by General Sickles, pretty much stayed in West Ham. Of course, when Sickles gets out there, General Meade comes right up, you probably heard the story. And he says, General, what the heck are you doing down here? And he said, Well, I didn't like the ground that you put me on. But General Meade, if you, if you want me to go back to the original location, I'll, I'll do that. And Meade points across the field and he says, General Sickles, you see all those Confederates out there? You think they're going to let you do that? Of course, he was stuck where he was. And his, his core basically got wiped out. All right, in the interest of time, we all know what happened on July 3. General Lee has attacked the left flank. He's attacked the right flank. He's now going to test the Union Center. There is a council of war on the evening of July 2nd. General Meade gets his boys together. Gentlemen, should we retreat? Should we stay where we are? Should we attack? His generals had surveyed the land, and they said, General, let's let old Bobby Lee come to us. General Meade then says to General Gibbon, You know, General, they tried here, they tried here, Pulse Hill, first day, they're going to hit you right in the center. And in and around the couple of trees, in and around the famous batteries. That's where Meade concentrates another six, seven thousand troops on the morning of July the 3rd. Anybody guess where the 20th Maine wound up? Say again. Anybody guess where the 20th Maine wound up? Behind me. Back there behind me, headquarters. Back there behind me, they originally put them on big round top for a short period of time, make sure the Confederates didn't swing around, but then they put them, that's right, exactly right. Of course, we could charge Dales and Valley, Valley Gettysburg is essentially over. He takes a lot of static from President Lincoln, why didn't he pursue? He could have wiped out General Lee's army. We kind of tell them what we were battered, they were battered, it just wasn't, it wouldn't have worked. Meade's wagon train on uh, July the 4th, of course, the Pittsburgh Falls, July the 4th, it's a muddy, rainy day, a terrible day. His wagon train going back across into Virginia, about 15 miles long. There was some harassing of the Union Army to the Confederates, but no major battle occurred. In the Eastern Theater on July 4th. They were then shipped off to the Western Theater. Oates gets into a little controversy, winds up in a different unit. And as Colonel Oates, I hope someday people write about Gettysburg, go visit Gettysburg, write a book about what all happened. Now we're fortunate. If anybody's interested in this portion of the battle, this is, I mean, I've read a lot of books and read a lot of manuscripts and read a lot of university stuff. This is the one book that kind of tells it all in great, great detail. It takes the parallel between Colonel Oates and Joshua Chamberlain. And we are very fortunate from a history standpoint. Colonel Oates 
becomes a very responsible American citizen. One of the reasons I wanted to portray him, he was, uh, he believed in his cause. He fought for the Confederacy. He goes back to his town. He practices law. Gets elected to Congress, and ultimately becomes the 29th governor of the great state of Alabama. He dies in 1910, so he writes a lot. He writes a lot about his war experience. You may know Joshua Chamberlain, who was a professor of rhetoric at Bowdoin College, is given the honor by General Grant to stack the arms at Appomattox, survives the war, of course, becomes a very prominent figure in Maine, goes back to Bowdoin College, and becomes the president of that university. I have a copy of his, uh, of his speech, and he's very eloquent about his dream for the country. He is also, some historians would say, a rather self-promoting individual compared to some other generals in the, uh, in the Civil War. For example, General Sears Green, who was on Copes Hill at the same time we were talking about Little Rounds Up, was one brigade, stops nearly a whole war from General Ewell from taking the hill. Green kind of disappears into private life. Meanwhile, Joshua Chamberlain gets the Medal of Honor. Not saying he didn't deserve it, he certainly did. A lot of Medals of Honor were handed out during the Civil War. For example, General Custer's brother, Thomas Custer, received two Medals of Honor. I think he was the only one in the Civil War to get two. I'm an old guy, sometimes my memory doesn't work. Uh, and the second one he got was that Sailor's Creed for capturing a um, General Ewell's Corps was trying to break out right before Appomattox in early April. So he gets a Medal of Honor for capturing a Confederate flag. Joshua Chamberlain passes away in 1914 and he continues to write about the war for many, many years. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been an extreme pleasure. I want to thank Jerry and Marilyn for continued friendship, loyalty, and certainly the invitation and the honor to, to be with you tonight. Um, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. But if you've got any questions, I'm going to answer them. Sir, thank you. A lot of people may not be aware that President Nixon's great grandfather was killed at Gettysburg that's and is buried there. That's correct. And the other question I had is the uh, in one of your slides you just made a comment about the Union water plotter got trapped behind your lines and during picket charge, if I remember reading in the book, when you guys were retreating, he said I jumped out of the bushes and started firing at you. Is that a correct story? I think I spread it to uh, Peter Chamberlain's book of the 20th May. Well, uh The Confederates had taken charge of performing a maneuver called the On Echelon. General Lee points to the Cope Trees, says, Gentlemen, that's your target. General Kemper, way over there. General Pettigrew, General Trimble, way over here. The monuments are lined up on Confederate Avenue, consistent with where Virginia, North Carolina, and Mississippi, Alabama was. Now, there were over a hundred Confederate guns in that general vicinity, somewhere in the woods, and kind of swung around in a, in a small arc. There was infrared fire near the angle. There was a New Jersey regiment on the Confederate left, and a Rhode Island regiment on the uh, Confederate right that came out onto the battlefield and kind of engulfed the Confederacy, so they were being fired on from three directions. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, there were no Union troops back on what I'm calling Confederate Avenue where the attack started. Bear in mind, General Lee is back there with his staff in the general vicinity of where the Virginia Memorial, the Virginia Monument is. So I don't think there was too many Union soldiers in that area, but they did come around and form what I'm calling a horseshoe uh, a couple hundred yards near the high water mark. Yeah, I may not have mentioned that question. 
My understanding is like you guys sent a water party up, and so did the union forces, the little round up, and then they got caught behind your line and just laid down for a long plum run. Plum run! Yes, yeah. uh, I got a slide. Plum run is in, is in here. Yeah, I, I'm just assuming that's what was. Uh, um, that's a long way from. The center of action on uh, uh, the little hat top. Also, bear in mind the probably the, the best spring to get water is up on Colts Hill. Spangler Spring back back in those days was uh, was was a pretty pretty good place to get water. But that was a lot of fun. I apologize. I can't exactly relate to the. Uh, yeah, I may not be asking the question. No, you're probably, probably asking, yeah. I, I, I just can't relate to the scene, I'm sorry. Anything else? Sir, I, I thought it was interesting, I saw in the Western paper uh, a couple uh, weeks ago, a few days ago, where the, probably due to pressure, the, uh, uh, fathers of Richmond in Richmond, Virginia, removed a 15-foot statue of General Lee, and instead of putting it in storage or um, um, uh, some sort of a memorial, they broke it up and, and got rid of it. Now, three pieces. Uh, uh, with that going on, where does it stop? Because almost all the Fort, uh, as such as Fort Hood, where I was, uh, and and uh, uh, several other forts in the south today were named after Confederate generals, and you can't change uh, change the name of all those forts. What well, so I find it interesting. A couple of comments, uh, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to be one hundred percent on point. Uh, you're absolutely right. We have Fort Lee, Fort Brand Order in Fayetteville, for example, Fort Lee across the town side of uh, Petersburg. Um, to the best of my knowledge, at least today, on a national battlefield, Gettysburg, Antietam, Charlottesburg, Chicago, Pittsburgh, the United States government has said, and it may actually be illegal, to touch any of those monuments, federal or confederate. Second of all, yes, they uh, they did decide for whatever reason to dispose of General Lee. My understanding, I stopped at the Virginia Welcome Center on my way up here last week, and there's a historian who volunteers there. I said, What's the story? I heard they cut it in three pieces. And he said, Well, it was cast in three pieces, and they probably wouldn't, wouldn't be able to move it unless they cut it up. That may be an excuse. I'll give you a better example. In New Orleans, almost some two, three years ago, the mayor and the governor decided that they were going to dispose of General Pierre and Gustav Tucson Bolivar. And his statue was on a circle. You can picture the man, the botanical gardens in the back, one of the most beautiful settings in the city, a little bit outside the city, kind of a suburb. He was on a circle. A giant granite pedestal, and on the front of the pedestal, and the history of a general, he was on his horse. Now, back in the day, the Sons of Confederate veterans raised money and had a European sculpture cast there. They paid for it, they owned it, including the real estate, as they did in Memphis. Painted them from the forest. They owned the real estate. They owned the statue until the depression came and they could no longer pay the tax. They then gave it to the city. In the case of New Orleans, my understanding was there wasn't a corresponding law that protected it. In the case of Memphis and in the great state of Tennessee, there were laws that protected any monument, any statue, including Nathan Bedford Forrest, who is controversial. And by the way, at the site of his statue, 
his wife and children were interred in the same plot. So what the mayor did very cleverly is he gave, I think for God, I have to give some remuneration, right, some consideration. He gave it to a limited liability company who then somehow circumvented the law and they moved the general, his body and his wife's body. I don't have a good answer for you. Where does it go? Where does it stop? Why, why is it being done other than people don't seem to like the idea? But I will leave you with one thought. There's one really interesting thing about it. Well, two thoughts. There's one really interesting thing about history. It actually happened. It actually happened. I'll leave you with another thought. I used to travel internationally quite a bit. I've been in 52 different countries and spent a fair amount of time in Israel. I was in two death camps. Death in the war, obviously. And when you go to Poland and you're trying to do business, one of the things they want to do is they want to take you to see those sites. Now, I'm probably a coward, but I walked through the gate at Auschwitz, and I froze. I felt cold. I felt that this was an evil place. And it wasn't mind over matter. It was like I'm staring at a place of evil. And the Israelis will never let us forget. There's parts of history that aren't they aren't good, they aren't nice. I mean, there's things that are happening in our history. I mean, slavery was evil. But as uh, people a lot smaller than I was, I am, have always said. We shall forget the doom to the people said yes, sir. I well it's just a personal story, but it's interesting that the first Air Force general to be killed over here in World War II, Nathan Bedford Forrest Jr. And so, the highest ranking general to be killed in combat was Nathan or was Simon Bolmore Buckner, both descendants of Confederate generals. Didn't know that. Fascinating. Appreciate you sharing. Fascinating. Fascinating. Anything else I can help you with? I will say this. Um, I'm a volunteer, member of several different groups, including the uh, alumni of the Civil War Heritage Foundation. We've done presentations as far west as Chicago, as far south as I can't remember where, somewhere near southern Alabama, Florida, all over Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio. Uh, Virginia, New Jersey. Uh, if I can help anybody, I'm not a guy in the world Confederate. I was born and raised in New Jersey and New York. Uh, I think we trade both sides, and I just I just love history. So if there's anything I can do for anybody, there's some uh, free information, some maps, and stuff from Gettysburg, Virginia, North Carolina. I've had a plan in uh, over the years. You've been great. I've enjoyed being here, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, John. What, a, what an amazing program, really. I'm sorry we didn't have this whole room back full. And uh, John and his wife, Charlene, we got to be real good friends of ours. And John has two homes, one in, one in Canton and one down in South Carolina. He's back and forth about every month between the two homes. So I, I cannot imagine. So I, I, one of the reasons for why I had to have John at this time is uh, he had to be here in Ohio. He was uh, here in Zor this past weekend. So. And uh, this, uh, this was, was filmed to me, that I noticed I am back here with the, with the projector. So uh, uh, the library will have it on Facebook, and I'll, I'll send it out, I'll send the contact information out to you folks and uh, everybody on the list. Speaking of the list, where did my, okay, there's my clipboard there. I wonder where you didn't care about that. So, uh, well, thank you so much, John. What a, what a, Chuck full of information that was, and all the, the models up here and everything are, are just <coughs> incredible. Uh, by the way, I, I think something worth mentioning, how Fulton here is sitting here. It was a lot about Gettysburg. How many years, how did you, you and Val went to Gettysburg and you put up the, the um, what do you call them, at the cemetery and for how many years? There's several of us members of the Triple Nickel Honors Group, and they sponsored the uh, flag the uh, U.S. regulars at Gettysburg, 
And uh, so every year for about, I think it's about 15 years, we decorated graves at the uh, Remembrance Day. And, uh, there are about, I don't remember how many, about 15, but there's about, I think, 142 U.S. regulars buried in Gettysburg. Nobody adopted them, so the triple nickel out of Worcester <coughs> decorated, uh, sponsored the flags, and uh, so we have, have a connection. But Charlie was involved in that? Yeah. 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 Charlie, uh, Rich Quebec, and I, and I don't know if there's any other triple nickel folks here. Oh, okay, that's a wonderful thing you guys with yeah. Triple. So the triple nickel, the 555th, if you're not familiar with that, so that's, that's a wonderful thing for the, for the uh, folks to do that. There are ladies involved too. Oh, uh, okay. This is both. Okay, well, anything else? Well, uh, I presume in October we'll probably have, still have a maximum of 50 people. So yep. we'll need to register. Uh, for that. Who will that be out? Uh, pardon? Who will sign up today? Well, okay. Yeah, if you want to sign up with me, I can do that. Okay. Yep. Okay, well, I still appreciate the library taking care of the registration. Okay, anything else, anybody? Well, thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>